for that. Good morning. <laughs> welcome to Anchor Church. If you are in the building, if you are watching us through that screen right there, we welcome you. I'm glad that you have given us the opportunity to be part of your walk with Christ. We don't take it lightly. Thank you so much for joining us. You that are in the room, hope you know I love you. Hope I have made that clear. If not, let me know, and we'll see what we can do to step it up. We'll do more hugs, more phone calls, more pat you on the back and pat you on the head and make no. That's not how we do things. Some of you are laughing at me already. Oh, but those of you that are online, we want to do everything we can to make you feel included. We're working on some ideas to find ways to pull you guys in and make you feel more connected to us. Um, I actually have a couple that's recently started coming to the church that is passionate about helping me do that, which is great. Um, the Lord is growing our church, both online and in person. We've got more people watching on Facebook than we've ever had. Uh, I've had a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, observations online where this, the views on YouTube have spiked. We're like, I don't know where all of you are, but those of you on the other side of this camera, thank you. God bless you. Um, and those of you that are here, welcome. It's good, good to have you and good to be gathered in the Lord's house. Even as warm as it is, I love seeing all the fans. Those of you online can't see that. It's not that I have fans, it's that the people have fans because our air conditioning has died we're praying about how the lord's going to handle that and still we have a pretty full room even with some families out and traveling and sick and holidays and we've still got a good group of people in here this morning it's exciting what the lord's doing here he has a message for us today psalm chapter 66 i've already told the folks in the room so for those of you online i'm going to read 20 verses this morning if you can sit through a three-hour marvel movie you can sit through me reading a chapter of the bible if that convicts you, I'm not sorry. If it doesn't convict you, I hope you can laugh with me. Psalm chapter 66, verses 1 through 20 is what we're going to read. If you like to give titles to your notes, the title of this morning's message is How We Emerge from the Test. How We Emerge from the Test. Let's read the word. Let's pray. Let's hear what the Lord says today. Beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 66, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name and make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. All of the earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. Come and see the wonders of God. His acts of humanity are all inspiring he turned the sea into dry land, and they crossed the river on foot, and there we rejoiced in him. He rules forever by his might. He keeps his eye on the nations, and the rebellious should not exalt themselves. Praise our God, you people. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He keeps us alive and doesn't allow our feet to slip. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap, and you placed burdens upon our back. You let men ride over our heads, and we went through fire and water, but you brought us out into abundance. I will enter your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. I will offer you the fatted sheep as a burnt offering, and with the fragrant smoke of rams, I will sacrifice oxen with goats. Come and listen, all you who fear the Lord, and I will tell you what he's done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth, and praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened, and he has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. May God be praised. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love away from me. Let's pray this morning. Father, what better prayer could I pray than the one that David has written? But this morning we come before you humble to be in your presence and grateful for all that you have done. We come this morning to hear your word, to honor the commandment that we should stay in fellowship with one another so that we may also stay in fellowship with you. Today, Lord, honor this gathering. Be at the center and the focal point of everything that is said and done this morning and accomplish your purpose in spite of what reason we may have come this morning. May your word and your will be done in our life because we are here in your name. I pray that your spirit would communicate what you need to be heard to each person that is listening that they would hear precisely what you need them to hear and not that they would walk away just having heard something clever and exciting, but they would hear something and that you would give them the strength and better yet, the opportunity to implement what they have heard and use it for your glory in the world. I pray that to that task and to that end, you would make me adequate to speak well and communicate exactly what you would have for your people this morning. Let your anointing rest on me and in this place today as we've come to honor you. 
We ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And amen. What better prayer could I pray than that? We could just read that again and have an altar call. But there's much to learn from the way that David speaks here when he addresses the people. I want to put this in context for you before I even begin to preach and teach out of this passage. Many of you may or may not be aware that the book of Psalms is not just David sat down for a weekend like bands do and decided to write an album. That's not how that worked. He wrote these Psalms over the course of his lifetime and over the course of his, his tenure as the king of Israel through his ups and through his downs, in the same way that the book of Acts was written over the entirety of the New Testament, the book of Psalms was written over the entirety of the reign of King David. And these are songs and psalms and prayers that he wrote at different times. And if you care to study them, you can find what was going on in history at the time that David wrote this psalm. And if you go back and look at David writing about this psalm, there's a repeat of something that's happened in Israel's history that's happening again. If you go back and look in the book of Ezra, you'll see that the Israelites are no longer enslaved to the Egyptians, but as they are frequently known to do, they have forgotten their way and they have begun to wander and now they have become enslaved or ruled by the people of Persia. But the Persian king has had grace upon them and has allowed them the opportunity to rebuild their temple. And David writes this psalm as the foundation of the temple is being laid again for the first time, as Israel is being given the opportunity, even in the midst of their slavery, to turn their hearts back to their God and begin worshiping Him in the way that He called them to since the foundation of the earth. Knowing that this is the case, Israel has been through some hard times. The people individually have been through some hard times, and the nation has suffered greatly. Not once, not twice, but many times if you read through the Old Testament. And there's something valuable to be learned from that because in the midst of all of that suffering, David writes this psalm and says, shout joyfully to the Lord. All of you that will hear, listen, will you see how great my God is? Will you come and see the wonders of God? And will you remember and recall and stand upon the foundation of the greatness of what he has done as we lay a new foundation for what he will do? David calls to these people and the Lord calls to us this morning. I make this statement to you as we continue, and we'll pivot from this point the rest of the morning. The life of a disciple of Christ is marked by the victories of God, not by the victories of man. The, the life of a disciple of Christ is marked by God's victory in their life. God has won. God is victorious. God does not lose. God does not abandon us. We sang it this morning, your heart won't stop coming after me. It's built on God's victories, not ours, but there's an implication there that there is a war that must be fought, there is a test that will come, and there is difficulty that will challenge us, and it must be God that defeats it, and we must be submitted to and willing to follow him through it if we're to see victory ourselves and participate in the victory that he's already won. The life of a disciple is marked. We like to look at the victories and say, look at the great thing that's happened to him. Look at the way he's won. Look at the way he's overcome. But the truth of the matter is you weren't necessarily walking with him through the difficulty or her through the hard times and the loss and the years of barrenness. That victory is an indication that someone has been through something difficult and the Lord has brought them out victorious. Not that they are so smart, not that they are so anointed, not that they are so talented, not that they are so much more blessed than you. It is simply that they are submitted and willing to walk through it because the test absolutely will come and the Lord is the one that will bring us through it. It is his victory. The victories that we see come because of the inevitable testing that comes against us and to us. And we have to be careful not to just say, the testing has come against me. We think of testing sometimes as if it is an opposition, that the enemy has come. When you are in a classroom in an educational setting, do they bring in someone the prison, from the prison who wants to destroy the children and have them administer the test? The teacher who loves and cares for and has nurtured and has invested everything that they have into those children in that classroom is the one that says, now it's time to see what we have learned and administrates a test. And there are some people who will make the remark, oh, I'm not hearing from the Lord. He's not saying anything. Well, what has the Lord been investing in you over this time? Because the teacher rarely speaks during the test. 
There's silence during the test. The fact that I'm not hearing from the Lord right this minute doesn't mean that he has abandoned me. Perhaps this is the time when I should demonstrate what he has invested and I should trust him and have faith in what he's promised me that is going to come through. Perhaps this is the time when I should stop complaining and I should submit and I should relent and I should allow the Lord to do the work instead of trying to stir myself up to do some great thing for him. Victories come because of the inevitable testing. We often make so much of the test itself, but the test is not what's really at issue when we're at a time of difficulty. The issue is how will we emerge from this test? This is the message that I have for you this morning. How will we emerge from the test? In what condition will we be on the other side? Because the test will be administrated, and we have no choice but to take it. How will we emerge? David addresses this in this psalm. David came before the Lord first. And when we read the beginning of this, it's very easy to look at Psalms and start to write off David because, the, oh, he's one of those people that just celebrates everything. David's a, here he is praising again. There he is. Just, there's David. Wow. We forget sometimes in those times of upness that David was also down. David was the definition of manic depressive. I don't think they use that word in the DSM anymore, but David was the very definition of he had super high highs and super high lows. He was either on top of the world and his world had con or his God had conquered everything, or David was under the world and burying the burden of it all by himself, and God had abandoned him. David did not have an in-between. I worked for a guy one time, and uh, he looked at me one time, and I, he, was, he, was not, uh, he was not the most sanctified of all men. But he was a funny guy. He was an old military guy. And he looked at me one time, and he's, I will spare you the profanity, but I'll give you the sentiment. He said to me, boy, you ain't got but two speeds, wide freaking open, and ain't doing nothing. <laughs> this is David. He's way up here, or he's way down here. He doesn't just have a normal setting. He's got a high and a low. David comes before the Lord, though, and in this moment, he is in one of those high places, and we can't dismiss the highs just because they're common any easier than we can dismiss the lows. We have to understand and have some perspective on them. David comes in this psalm praising God at the beginning, even though he's aware of the lows that have been and the lows that are about to come. His response, having been through the test and knowing yet another test is coming, is to praise his God. He came before the Lord to praise him, and his first shouts were to proclaim the glory of God. Now, he did not come before the Lord in this passage and just proclaim general greatness of God. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so great. Oh, God, you're so wonderful. David came with specifics. David was locked and loaded. David knew what God had done for him. He didn't just bring flowery terms and big words that he thought would impress people or that might impress God and get his attention. David came with specific detailed descriptions of the occasions when God had made himself known in his life because David had been through some stuff and knew who God was and what he could do. He references the journey of Israel because God had personally undeniably made himself known in the nation of Israel and in the life of David. Each and every one of these references that David makes is rooted in a time of difficulty and stress and oppression and of what seemed like human impossibility. There is no way I will survive this. How many times have you cried out and said, I'm not going to make it? How many times have you found yourself in a dark place and said, there's no human that could survive this? How many times have you gone to the Lord to argue with him and say, this is not fair. No one can live through this. Let me share something exciting with you. David also wrote in Psalm 95, 4, he says the, the, the mountaintops are the Lord's and the valleys are in his hand. But if you go back and, I mean, that's, that's pretty if you read it in English. But if you go back and read it in the original language, and get to the very root of it, David was speaking in some pretty wide, pretty broad, pretty desperate terms. And he says, the Lord's strength is on your mountaintop, but his power is in the valley. When you are at that place where I can't take anymore, I'm going to give up. There's no way any human can sustain this. You have to know that the most abundant heavenly resource you have in that valley is the supernatural power of God and his Holy Spirit. His power is in the low place because it's the place where we have to give up and say, you're the only one that can get me through. The test is not whether I'm strong enough and awesome enough and doggone it if enough people like me that I can make it through this. The test is, will I trust God when I can't? Where's my faith? Each and every one of these things that David praises God for was rooted in those times of impossibility and difficulty. Every one of those times, when you look at the state of Israel, 
when they emerged from their tests, whether they did it successfully or whether they did it poorly, they set the tone for an entire generation that came after them. When you look at the people that left the, left the slavery in Egypt and they grumbled and complained, what happened to them? A journey that should have taken days took 40 years and every single one of them died. They failed that test and it affected an entire generation. And even the next generation picking up the, picking up the, uh, the, the mantle of God's promise and going into the promised land, they went into it not knowing what it looked like when, the, because they, when a person had been faithful and walked in the promise of God. Because their family had grumbled and complained and they had grown up for 40 years. Some of them had been born in the desert. They were 28, they were 32 years old and all they had seen was their complaining parents and knew that we don't, we don't know what faithfulness looks like because these people didn't have it. We're setting the stage for the next generation when we decide how we will walk through a test. We have to emerge victorious and we can't do it without faith in Christ. Each and every one of these times, Israel's response set the tone for the next generation. Each of the praises that David gives remarks on a time when Israel seemed doomed to fall apart because they had failed to trust God. Each of these times. And David calls on Israel as he reminds, us of, reminds them of these things. He calls on Israel and he says, Praise God for what God has actually done. Not what you did, not how you reacted, not how you responded, not how well you think you did, not how many comments and likes you got. Respond based on what God did in those situations. And respond based on what God did. Don't come to him praising falsely because you hope he'll do what you want. That's a completely different way of looking at things, isn't it? We come to the Lord and I will praise him because I think enough praise going in will be like that fourth quarter in the vending machine that makes the thing drop out that I want. Don't come praising him for what you want him to do. When we come to the Lord, we praise him locked and loaded because we've known some things, we've done some things, and we know who he is, and he's proven himself to us again and again. I'm going to praise him for who he is and what he actually did, not what I want or what I hope for. I can thank him for what he's done, but I, gotta, I can thank him for what I hope he will do. And I can say, Lord, I, pr I pray that you will, if it be your will, would you? But my praise comes out of a place of knowing something. When we come together to praise him, we sometimes want to confine that to a worship service on Sunday morning, and that's great. We'll use that as an example, but you need to know that's not the only place we praise and worship. It's not just the four, five, six songs that we do. It's a lifestyle, but that would be a whole different message, and that's not where we're going this morning. But when we do come together to praise him, we have to come praising him for who he is and what he's done. We have to know who he is. It would be so weird if someone came up to me and told me that I was such a great doctor. Oh, Rocket, you're such a wonderful physician. And oh, how you have healed. And oh, how you have, have mended. And oh, how... I am terrible at math and science. I am not a doctor. I don't have a PhD in anything except maybe sarcasm. You can laugh, it's okay. Some people don't know they can laugh in church. I'm not soliciting laughs, but I want, want you to be, be at liberty, it's okay. But we want to go to God and thank Him for things that we hope He will do or we wish He would do or things that would paint Him in the way that we want to see Him rather than the way He actually is. And He says, praise me for who I am and what I've done you got to know him, and you don't know him until you've walked something with him. Too often we'll come and we'll praise God in these vague general terms, but we do it because we've never known him, because he's not won a victory. We've not let him win a victory in our life because we have stubbornly refused to take the test. We have seen difficulty come, and we've said, I know how to get through this. I'm going to figure it out. And then when we get through, we give him praise afterwards as if he was present. He's like, you never even talked to me about it. You did the best you could and you're not dead and, you know, good on you for clawing through that way. But we didn't talk. You don't know who I am or what my will was because you tried to fix it yourself. Ugh. We can't praise God in vague general terms. We've got to agree to take the test and walk through it with him and see what a victory in him is like. So that we'll have something to praise him for and something to praise him about. We won't know the great power and victory of God until we have been tested. We will not know the great power and the great victory of God until we have been tested and we have walked through it in his strength, not our own. 
We won't know who we are, nor will we know who he has become in and through us until we've walked through that test that only his spirit can survive. But I don't, I don't want that. That's hard. That's difficult. Sorry, not sorry. This is the way. Right? This is the way. We spend way too much time praising him and thanking him in advance for what we want him to do and not enough praising him for what he's done and who he is. And a lot of times that's because we have yet to allow him to do a great thing in our life. Oh God, I want your breakthrough. Oh God, I want power. Oh God, give me direction. Oh God, give me. And then the minute that we leave the altar or walk out of the prayer closet, we begin doing what we must and how we think it should be done and expect him to show up in the midst of me. But we've not left a door open. We've not given him an opportunity. That little prayer that you left in the prayer closet stays there and doesn't get a response if you don't bring the God you prayed to with you. If you don't agree to walk through what he's presented you with and call upon him to get through it. When David's talking about the children going to the Red Sea and walking across it, how many of you are able to walk across water? How many of you are able to bend it and move it out of the way and walk across somewhere dry? Even if you could do it for yourself, how many of you would be strong enough to do it for a nation of millions? I can't even get my kids in the car to go somewhere on time. And I know how to drive and how to cook and how to put clothes on them. And they understand my words and speak the same language I do. How in the world, if my God's thoughts are not my thoughts and his ways are not my ways, do I think I'm going to go solve his problem? I need him. The nation of Israel met a river and, or a, a, a sea, and there's no way they were going to get across that. And the army that was behind them was armed. It was one of the most tactically advanced armies in all of the world at the time. There's no way they were going to fight that army off. The test is, Lord says, do you trust me? That faith that you said you had, those praises, all of that worship and glory and honor that you gave me in the temple, can you put it to good use when it matters? That old version of Robin Hood that came out when I was a teenager with Kevin Costner when he's nailing every shot with the bow and arrow and then Marion comes up beside him and says, but can you do it amidst distraction? Can you actually put it to use when it matters? Or is it just something that you've rehearsed well in the classroom amongst the other students to impress the teacher? We will continue to fail until we allow God the opportunity to demonstrate who he is by leading us to a place of difficulty and trusting him when we arrive there. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 6 says, Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? And I hope you will recognize that we do not fail the test. Paul is not calling us to barge into some tests that we set up for ourselves and to set the terms for ourselves. He's not saying we're going to decide what the test is and I'm going to examine myself by giving myself a test that I know I can pass. I know from experience that's what a lot of middle school students like to do. But that's not how it works. The truth is I'm unstable and I'm biased. What Paul is calling me to do is examine my faith by allowing myself to be in a position where only God can prevail and demonstrating that I know how to lean on him. There is not a testing from God apart from the one where we rely on him so that he can demonstrate he's there. We're not testing him to see, God, are you actually here? We're not putting ourselves, okay, God, I'm going to step off the side of this mountain, straight down, miles to the earth, and if you're really God, don't let me die. <laughs> God says, I created gravity, and it does what it does. The number of times that God steps in and supernaturally changes the laws that he's put in place and changes his mind, even in Scripture, are few. We don't test and tempt God in this way, but when we come to a place of testing, we depend on the Lord. When we create our own tests, we fall into the, the, the trap of manipulation, the trap of, of witchcraft, of thinking I have control of the Spirit and I will bend it to do what I want. That's not how testing works. Paul speaks and David speaks of allowing ourselves to be tested and not just allowing it to happen, but recognizing that we're in a test and recognizing that God alone can prevail. If we call ourselves disciples, we've got to allow our faith to be tested, and we've got to recognize when the test is happening. Stop calling everything the devil that doesn't go your way. Cut it out. 
Oh, it's the devil. The lady in front of you that had the super long Starbucks order that made you late for work is not the devil. She may sound and look like it. You may be irritated as the devil at her and need to repent, but she is not the devil. It is not the devil that caused you to crash your car. It is not the devil that made your bills late. It is not the devil that caused the majority of the difficulty in your life. You're good enough at ignoring the Lord and causing those problems yourself. He doesn't have to come help you with a lot of that stuff. The truth of the matter is we're imperfect, and we live in an imperfect world, and sometimes things happen. Every unpleasant event that befalls you is not an attack of the enemy. The devil has more important things to do than being out to get you. He is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent the way God is. He can be in one place at one time, and if he's the most powerful evil thing who's determined at all costs to do everything he can to hurt God and destroy as many people as possible, what makes you think he cares whether you get to work on time? That's not the devil. Some of the problems that have come against you are just the consequences of living in an imperfect world. We're living out the consequence of an imperfect inheritance. You can thank Adam and Eve for that when you get there. We're imperfect. Wickedness happened. Sinners act like sinners, and that includes you when you're the sinful one or the one that makes somebody late because you had a complicated order that day. Sometimes that's you on the other side of that fence. Life happens. Other times the difficulty is actually a test that determines if we truly believe and woe be to us if I take something that God has allowed to happen and I give the devil credit for it. There's a word for that. It's called blasphemy. It's an ugly word. We don't want to do that. Stop calling everything that goes wrong the devil and start recognizing what's the Lord and what's just life happening to me. We've got to recognize the places where God has been faithful. The tests are inevitable, and so is God's faithfulness, especially when we're in the midst of a test. That's the time we should be remembering how faithful he is and how good he is and how much care he has taken of us. David speaks specifically of that. He talks about it in specific terms in verses 5 and 7 of the passage we read this morning. He references Israel crossing the Red Sea while being chased by that overpowering army. David references God looking down on Israel from heaven and delivering them while their enemies taunted them and told them that God was paying no attention. I don't know how much time you spend online. I spend a lot of time online. And one of the most common things that I hear when people come into one of the lives that I do on a Friday night or come into one of the videos and want to make comments is they say, your God's not real. He's not paying attention. You're, you're praying to nobody. You're wasting your time. David says, even back then, this is before Christ. This is more than 2,000 years ago. There were people that wanted to say, God's not listening. He's not paying attention. But David references, I know that he is because God was looking at us and paying attention to us and walked us through this difficult time. David talks about your feet not slipping off of the path. It's a reference to all of the times over history that Israel has faltered and made bad decisions and failed the test. But God sustained them spiritually and physically anyway. David ends that section and he says, he keeps us alive. David praised God for the foundation of God's faithfulness. He didn't praise God for how great Israel was or how great he was. He praised God for how great God was even when Israel was not great at all. We have to praise God for how great God is even when I have not been great. In fact, I need to acknowledge that I am not that great so that I can see how great he is. Because as long as I still think I'm good enough and smart enough and doggone it enough, people like me. I'm taking on the role of the Lord. I've not given him a place to do what he says he'll do. I'm not that great, and I have to recognize that so I can praise God for who he is and give him the space to do what he does. We've got to learn to praise him even when our faith has failed. We've got to learn to praise him even when I have failed the test. Because even when I fail the test, I serve a faithful God. The fact that you have survived your difficulties is evidence that God has sustained you even when your own faith could not. Some of us want to say amen and some of us want to say, I don't like that at all. The fact that I'm not dead yet means that God took care of me. The fact that I ought to be dead 
my faith failed, and I have to admit that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what grace is about, is realizing that we fail, and he extends to us more than we deserve, and we're still here. David knew that. I told you he came locked and loaded to praise the Lord before we even start talking about testing. I'm praising him for what he's done because we've been some places and done some things, and he has sustained me even when I failed. John 10, 10 speaks to this as well. Jesus is speaking, and he says, A thief only comes to kill and steal and destroy, and I've come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, Paul writes on this theme, and he says, The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and guard you from what? From the evil one, from the enemy. Let's just get real. Somebody told me once, I feel like when you're preaching, you're just getting into my living room. You're all up into my business. Let me get in your living room for a minute. I know life happened to you. Life has happened to me. Life has happened to every single person I know. I will tell you something really practical and really honest. There's not a single person who has come to me and said, I feel like this is my home church and this is where I belong and I, I think this is where God has drawn me. There's not a single one of them who has not in a very short period of time after saying that encountered something that tried to wipe them out and test their faith and shake what God had said to them. And I'm not saying that because my church is so great. I'm telling you, anytime you try to attach yourself to something great that God is doing, anytime you are walking through and you see there's God and you commit yourself and I'm going to follow him, the enemy will come and try to destroy that. Or you will find yourself in a place where God will say, do you actually trust me? And the first thing that he throws at you is not the hardest thing you're going to face. This is just a, we need this as a foundation so you can keep going. Remember, David's rebuilding the foundation of the temple here. The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. I know life happened to you. I know it did. There have probably also been some occasions when the enemy really did come against you. I doubt Satan stood at the foot of your bed, but I'm sure that he sent some minions or at least some people under his influence to cause some difficulty in your life. I have no doubt about that. In fact, you may have faced some of those occasions and you may have failed the test and know that you failed it. And then the next test was whether you were going to be discouraged and give up after your failure or were you going to keep praising your God. But even if that happened, even if that happened, it is always the aim of the enemy to kill and to steal and to destroy. And we cannot take lightly the fact that if I have come through it, the Lord has sustained me even when I fell short. Because it is God who will cause me to be on my guard and keep me safe against the evil one. The enemy came in and whatever he did to you, he wanted to wreck you. And it didn't. That's not just some throwaway thing to make you feel good about yourself. I want you to see God's perspective on something for a minute. Because we're talking about how do we come through the test? How do we emerge? We have to be able to look at it from his perspective and look, some bad things happened. I get it. I know. And I'm not saying like a preacher that's never been touched by anything in his life. I flippin' know, okay? I know. But the enemy wanted to kill you and steal you and destroy you and ruin everything about you that resembled your father. And yet here you stand. Praise the God who has kept you from the fullness of the enemy's purpose against you. And then we get to verses 10 through 12 and we see something fascinating. When we start talking about the test, David has spent nine verses praising God specifically, exactly for what God's done because he's been through some stuff and fail or succeed, he is aware of how great his God is and he's praised him for those things. And now he says, we're going into a test. In fact, I remember the test we've been through and I know there's more coming and here's what David says about it. For you, God tested us. Wait a minute. God tested me? Yes, we covered this earlier in the lesson. The teacher tests. But it doesn't mean that God has come against you. I'm going to get ahead of myself. So read these three verses. God, for you, God tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap. What? Stay with me. You placed burdens on our back. Okay, I'm out. Stay with me. You let men ride over our heads. Come on now. <laughs> Stay with me. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out to abundance. God did not do horrible things to you to torment you. 
God did not do horrible things to you. He may have led you to a difficult place that made you uncomfortable. He may have allowed you to wander even in your own sin to a place that you could not dig yourself out of. But he did not abandon you and leave you there. And he certainly did not send you there to die. God did not send you into a difficult set of circumstances to put you in your place and teach you a lesson. God did not set you up as a whipping post so others could look at you and say, that's what you're not supposed to do. God did not do that to you. That is a lie from the enemy. It's absolute garbage. God did not put you in some place and beat you up and treat you poorly and torture and torment you just to make himself look great. That's not the God that we serve. Think about how absurd that is. Do you really think that your teachers in school assigned you impossible tasks simply so you would fail? And they say, ha <laughs> look how dumb these kids are. I'm the teacher, and I'm so smart, and I'm so awesome, and they're all idiots. Not a one of them. That teacher gets fired. That teacher gets disciplined. We don't serve a God like that. He didn't do those things to you. That idea is absurd. We do walk through some tests, and what we learn or what we find out through the test is what we actually learned in the process. We want to say that we have great faith and we want to say that we walk closely with the Lord and we want to say that I need all the benefits of this relationship with God, all the blessings and all the promises and all the... we got to walk through a test. Because sometimes the blessing and the abundance of God is what happens at the end of going through a really difficult time. And it's not that you earned it or you deserved it, it's simply that your faith is what you said it was. It's simply that you were aligned with the heart of God and now you've created an environment or he has created in you an environment where he can be made known and is present. I'm not just doing it for the prize, but a prize happens to come and I can give every bit of the glory and praise back to him for it rather than saying, look how great I am, look what I won. I have the world's biggest humble trophy. I keep it in my office in a glass case. It's six feet tall and I have light shining on it so everyone can see how humble I am when they come to my office. Until that's gone, you're still failing the test. God gets all the glory for everything that you've done. This is what the test is about. How do we come through it? We've got to allow ourselves to be tested, and we've got to recognize the test is happening and not curse God and not blame the devil for it. David says, you, God, have tested us. This is the process of education, of strengthening, of building some confidence, of empowerment, of preparing us for all that he desires and has planned for us. God, you tested us. There is no testimony without the test. I know that's one of those cheesy church sayings, and I don't love it either, but it absolutely applies here. If I haven't walked through something, I've got nothing to declare the greatness of God about. It's all just book knowledge and head knowledge and something that crazy preacher yells about for 45 minutes on Sunday. But if I've walked through some stuff, then... I can say, I know who my God is, and I can praise him because I remember what he did and where he was. And now that I'm here, I expect he's going to do no different because of who he is, not because I'm great. There's no gospel to declare if he hasn't saved you. There's no monument of faith where no foundation has been laid to build it. So the testimony of his greatness and his faithfulness is in us walking through the impossible trial and emerging from a difficulty where only he could have survived. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When we're guaranteed that we're going to face impossible odds, we need a God who can overcome impossibility. And when we know we're going to be in an impossible situation, who better to test us than the God who wants us to succeed? Who better to test us than the God who wants us to survive, than the God who wants us to make it and declare his glory in all the earth? So that he can have others who will also be saved and survive when the enemy comes for them. Who better to test us than God? Well, how do we recognize the test? You ever been in a position where you say, if I'd known what this was going to be like, I wouldn't have come? <laughs> you ever in a place where you said, if I knew what it was going to be like this, I never would have done it? There's a thing I saw online recently. I think you posted it. 
We don't do this because it's easy. We do this because we thought it would be easy. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, right? You ever find yourself in a place like that? That's often the place the test is happening. This is not what I signed up for. All my resources are gone. I didn't think this is the way it was going to go. I charged in knowing I was going to win and conquer, and now I find myself in a place where it's impossible for me to win. Now we're in the place where only God. Now we're in the place where we find out not my faith is so great, but do I have faith at all? And is my faith properly placed in the God of all creation? I thought I was following the Lord, but here I am in this mess. Yes. There's a good chance that that's not the devil. There's a good chance that we're finding out, do we believe? Do we truly trust the God that we say we follow? This is the opportunity that we have, and it's the opportunity to praise him for what he has done in anticipation of what he's about to do. We are many of us right now sitting in this room listening to me on the other side of that camera. Many of us are sitting in a place where we're on the precipice of seeing the glory of God in our life. I want to encourage you this morning to praise him where you're sitting and don't fail. Don't fail to recognize where he's come through for you. Don't fail to recognize that I'm still standing even despite my own failure in the past. Recognize that I'm standing here in a place that seems impossible because the Lord is about to do what I can't. We are about to see his glory and the fulfillment of the promises that he's made. We're about to see him for who he is if we will simply allow him to test us and walk through this with us and allow him to be the one who solves it rather than my cleverness and my history and how great I am. David describes it like this. He says, you refine as silver is refined. That's with heat. That's with difficulty. We ask too casually for the fire of God. We sang it this morning, let your fire burn inside of me. Because we see the fire as power, but fire burns what isn't pure. And if I am not, then what is in me that doesn't belong there, that does not reflect the Lord, it won't survive. I'm not saying don't pray for the fire, but beware what you're asking for. Don't ask too casually for the fire of God. God can't have any part with wickedness, and when the Spirit of God comes, it burns away everything that's not pure. You refine as silver is refined. I'm finding out in this difficulty that I'm kind of angry at God about some stuff. I'm finding out in this difficulty that I don't trust Him about some things. I'm finding out in this difficulty that I'm still bitter about what they did to me. Who? Sounds like the test. Oftentimes when things are simultaneously going well and yet I feel really stressed in this situation, there's the test. There's the refinement. There's the process of purity. There's the presence of his fire. David also says, you lured us into a trap. Let me clarify this. This does not mean God set a snare. He's not trying to trap you by the ankle so he can come put a bullet in your head and take you home for dinner. Any hunters? Just, okay. Okay. You lured us into a trap. God did not set a snare for you. This phrase literally means, God, you led us to where we were unaware you were working. Go back and look at the Hebrew. It means you led us to a place where we were unaware. God will lead you to a place where we're not aware of what he's doing. And he will give you the opportunity to trust him so you can see his glory. We have to go to the impossible places to see what only he can do. Don't refuse to where God leads you and miss that glory. That's the test. Sometimes we disguise the idea of avoiding it as, oh, that's common sense not to go there. I'm being responsible by not going there. I'm, I'm exercising wisdom. It doesn't look wise that I, come on. When God leads somewhere and we don't follow that sin, that's obstinance. That's robbing ourselves of the glory of God in our life and upon the earth. We rob ourselves of everything we're seeking if we refuse to go to the hard place and let him demonstrate himself. David says, you place burdens on our backs. I don't want any more burdens. We need context for the burden. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, there's a comparison happening here. The responsibility of trusting him is far lighter than the consequence of your sin. But we will sometimes neglect to take the burden of the Lord upon us because we prefer the burden that is familiar. What the Lord places on you is not heavier, it just feels a little different. Don't make the mistake of refusing it. Don't make the mistake of seeing the change of burden as a punishment. His is lighter. 
Don't settle for the familiar weight. Recognize the test and adapt to the burden of the Lord. David also says, you let men ride over our heads and we went through fire and water. Remember, this is still David calling us to praise. We endured trials which seemed difficult and seemed impossible. He's calling to these people who would say, what you've put us through, God, is unfair. And David says, no, you serve an almighty God. He says, you let people ride over our heads in the midst of that. We have to recognize the test because we're in the impossible circumstance. We're in a, in a situation that defies all human reason. Well, God must be going to show up because it's not desi his desire that I should perish. These trials are necessary. We have to recognize them. We have to walk through them. Why? So that the disciple of Christ can know the victory of God. So that we can stand against the difficulties that man brings against us and so we can recognize when hell actually does come. We walk through the trials and the tests that God gives us and look at how David ends that section. He says, you brought us into abundance. You see how he says that? He does not say, we survived great difficulty. We overcome insurmountable odds. We clawed our way through and here we still stand. No, he says, you brought us out into abundance. We praise God for who he is and what he's done. The focus so often shifts to the abundance, but we don't, we're not focused on the abundance. We're focused not on the blessing. We're focused upon what God has brought us through, that God is the one who brought us through. How do we survive the test? We place our faith in him and we emerge. If we're ever to experience the fullness of God, we've got to praise him for who he is in the midst of the tests and the trials of following after him. And until we know this, we will never fully know him. This morning, do you want to know God? I don't mean know who he is like, oh, he's that guy. I don't mean casually know him from a distance. I don't mean know him just because of what I said. Do you want to know him for yourself? Do you truly want to know him and see him? Then allow him to test you. Let him walk you through the test and let him walk you through it before the world throws one at you that does destroy you. Let the one who's in your corner walk you through and show you how great he is so you'll know who to lean on and call upon when something that could wipe you out does come. The test itself is not what matters, how you emerge from the test that matters. David describes two results and I'm coming to a close. Verses 16 through 19, come and listen, all of you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth, and praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened, and he paid attention to the sound of my prayer. There are two ways we emerge. One of them is discouraged. If I had cherished sin in my heart, God would not have heard me. If I had found myself in a place of difficulty and what the burden that was familiar and the difficulty that I could see and my own faith in myself is what I decided to lean upon. If I had cherished something other than God, that's sin. If I found myself in a difficult place and my actions demonstrated that I cherished something other than the Lord, he wouldn't have heard me. Have you ever been through something difficult and go, God's not, God doesn't hear me. God's not here. He's not answering I made it through, but barely. Why does that happen? Oftentimes it's because I don't recognize I was in the test and I haven't passed it. I tried to walk through it in my own strength. I tried to lean on my own understanding. When we don't recognize the test, we see difficulty as loss, we see hardship as abandonment, and we see help as hurt. When we have more faith in our sin than we have in him and when we cherish it, we do what James says in, in chapter 4, verse 3 of his book. We pray amiss. We pray the wrong way. But I pray it all the way through. Did you praise him for who he is? Did you ask him for his will and his purpose? Or did you simply pray for what you thought was best and hope he would support you in your decision? When we pray from a place of cherishing something more than we desire him, he does not honor that prayer. When we pray from a place of selfishness and when we pray from an earthly focus, we will emerge from the test discouraged. One way we emerge is discouraged, but the other is to emerge victorious and in praise. Come and listen to what God has done for me, David says. I called out to him and he answered. He was my first call, not my last resort. And at the time of difficulty, I turned to him. And even though it was hard and even though it hurt and even though it lasted longer than I thought it should, he prevailed and preserved me. 
When we submit to the test, we learn to recognize that the Lord is at work. When we have a history of firsthand experience, it allows us, even when we're surprised that the test came, even when it's a pop quiz, we learn to identify that he is setting his hand upon us even though we sit amidst the difficulty. This morning I want to tell you that the Lord is setting his hand upon many of you though you sit amidst difficulty. The Lord's hand is setting upon you. Recognize the test and give him glory and give him praise for who he is and let him solve it and let him walk you through it and come out victorious and praising him. Will you stand with me this morning? We can and we must emerge praising the Lord, giving him all of the glory and assured of his greatness and his faithfulness. We can emerge from the difficulty that we're walking through right now absolutely assured of who he is and what he will do. Disciples of Christ, if you're in this room with me this morning, praise him. As David says, know that he has not turned his faithful love from you even in the midst of your circumstance. Will you praise him? Look at where you are. Look at where you've been and see that you are still standing and praise him. See him at work where you are. Though he seems silent in this moment, remember what he's done in every other place that you have been. Praise him and watch him prevail. Emerge victorious and praising him this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you today for the opportunity to hear the words of David and your words and your example that you've spoken through him. God, give us the strength and the courage and the fortitude to allow ourselves to be tested. Father, show us yourself in the midst of our difficulty. Give us confidence in who you are. Remind us so that we can praise you of what you have done and what you have demonstrated and what we know to be true. Give us a personal relationship with you, Lord. Not some sweet, nice little, I want to sit in the corner and drink coffee with you, but some actual life experience with a God that prevails and doesn't want us to fail and has again and again proven himself to us so that we know he will prevail even in this that we face today. Show yourself to us, Lord, and show us who we are, what needs to be burned away, what has to ride by and ride over so that we can walk out victorious and abundant in you. Thank you, Father, for being faithful. Thank you that your love never fails. Thank you that your presence is never far from us. And thank you, Lord, that you've made a way in every circumstance for us to walk out faithful and preserved and even improved if we will trust you and submit to your will and your way in our place of impossibility. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. Thank you for the testimonies. Thank you for preserving me to today. And thank you that we will see it happen again. Yes, even in this. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with me this morning, with us this morning. Hope I'll see you again soon.